I'm super excited today to have my friend, Christina Bianchini here today. She is a registered professional, professional counselor. Um, she is a workshop facilitator and an event speaker. And I've known Christina for quite a few years. We've done a retreat together. I've um, attended one of the workshops that she's facilitated and I think she's absolutely brilliant. So I'm so happy to have her here today. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Louise. So the reason I reached out to Christina is because I often hear within our groups and programs that people are suffering with mental health, specifically depression. Mm -hmm. And it's really playing on their motivation to actually get into the part of activity because they're feeling depressed. And this can also be very much so when it's in the winter months where it's dark and it's rainy or snowing a lot. And mm -hmm. it's something that I'm hearing consistently. So I just wanted to reach out to you and maybe you can explain what depression is and how that might present itself for somebody. Yeah. So depression is, especially this time of year, as we do get into the winter and the darker months, it is something that is quite pervasive that a lot of people do come in and talk about. So depression, first of all, um, is caused by a lot of different factors. There is a biological factor, which is really just a decrease in serotonin in your brain, which makes it a lot harder uh, to think clearly. Um, sometimes it can be life circumstances, it can be past traumas that are coming back, it could be um, something different that's happened in your life that suddenly has upset the apple cart, so to speak. So all of those things um, can lead us to feeling depressed. So what does feeling depressed actually uh, feel like? So depression is often... Um, characterized by feeling really tired, maybe lethargic. Um, you know, it's not uncommon to spend all, you know, day in bed or just feel like you can never get enough sleep and, and never be rested. Often we really lack motivation to get out and do things. We lose interest in things that we used to love to do. So maybe suddenly we're pulling back from hanging out with friends uh, hang out with family. Maybe there were, we used to go out uh, for walks or go to the gym or any of those things. And we slowly pull back and make our life smaller and smaller. Um, there's often a feeling of being suddenly ha somehow detached mm -hmm. from, from the world, um, that there's this emptiness and, and helplessness that often comes. And, and sometimes people do get to a place where they're starting to think about uh, even scary things like like suicide, because what happens is um, our our thinking starts to become very self defeating in this place, where we start to think, "Wow, like I'm not good enough. Um, I can't do this. It's too hard." Uh, and then maybe we're starting to feel all those feelings of overwhelmed and apathetic, worthless that I was just talking about. And often what happens then is we just sleep all day, we avoid people, we stop going to the gym, we decrease our motivation. And then because of that, we go back to thinking we're lazy because suddenly it's an actual physical symptom. Like we, we want to do these things, but we just actually can't anymore. Like it, it feels almost like we're sort of in this paralysis state. So, you know, there's a reinforcing feedback loop that is happening here that is keeping us very stuck. Well, I think that my position as a coach and a trainer is that when we talk, you know, when somebody comes to the group or one on one and says, I just haven't been able to do the workouts that you've recommended that I that I signed up for. Um, I'm not able to do this program because I feel depressed and I mm -hmm. feel myself in a position where a it's it's kind of beyond my scope so that's why i'm really grateful that we're having this conversation but for two i've had depression too in my life and i know for myself that you know there's not really a lot i can do um in that moment to be like well i'm just going to push through here mm -hmm. so you know obviously there's a link between motivation and depression 
Uh, absolutely. And, and it, part of that is also because our, our thinking has gotten to the point where it is so self-defeating that we have created a, an atmosphere within ourselves where we truly believe that we can no longer actually do it. Yeah. Um, we've actually, and, and the thing is, is, is if, as, as long as we focus on something, even if it's negative, we actually, our brain will start to shift and actually will create that system. And so that's why we feel so paralyzed often in that moment. It, it's, yeah. you know, yeah. and it's not about, okay, totally I got to get up. What you're saying. Yeah. Um, so the, the thing that I find curious is that I know that exercise has helped me with depression. Do you agree with that as well? I absolutely agree with it. And I'll, I agree with it for a few different reasons. So I also <clears throat> have had my own history with depression for years and years. Um, and I know that for me, the only way out of it was actually action. So I know we just talked about, you know, motivation and, and not necessarily pushing ourselves too hard. There is also this, this piece though, for me that really worked around pushing myself in the smallest, gentlest way so that I could actually start moving out. When I exercised, when I went for a walk, it did a few things for me. It helped me to release endorphins. So when I'm depressed, my mood is like in the basement. Mm -hmm. It is in a place where, you know, I'm really, really low. So, you know, anything I can do to lift my mood uh, and release endorphins, like that, do that, right? And, and the thing is, is you don't actually, you don't have to go to the doctor. You don't have to like rely on anyone else to be able to lace up your shoes and just go for a little walk. Um, so I also think that exercise disrupts brooding. And what I mean by that is that sometimes when we're in that really depressed state, we're, you know, we're just kind of in that really flat lined place for so long that we actually believe that that's going to be our life forever mm -hmm. so exercise brings us like snaps us out of that even if it's only for five minutes it gives us the idea that there's a possibility that i can actually still move my body even if it's just me walking to the end of my driveway yeah i've even had um one lady in our group say that she gives herself permission to not follow through with the workout, but some yes. people just sit on the couch and put the, put the exercise video on. Yeah. And then she said, inevitably what ends up happening is she'll do part of it or some, you know, all of it mm -hmm. because just watching it makes her want to stand up and do it. So I think, um, if, you give yourself the permission to, okay, I'm going to go out and do the driveway, whatever. Like I, Christina, you have a pretty long driveway, I think, right? I do. Yeah. <laughs> um, but give yourself permission. I might only do half and, and there's no okay. failure behind that. It's just about a matter of getting up and, and getting out. And, and even if you go 10 steps, give yourself the permission to maybe not go all the way. And probably what will happen is when you're out there, you're, you're going to see the effects of exercise in a positive way and then it'll propel you to do a little bit more. Absolutely. And you know, um, I know somebody who used to always make a bargain with themselves, even when they weren't depressed to say, you know, I'm going to go and run for five minutes today. Um, and you know, no one ever, you know, and she never turned back, but she gave herself that permission of, I am going to do this for five minutes. And when, if, if she decided to not do it longer than that, that would be fine. Here's the thing about committing to a very small goal and achieving it. That would actually change my belief in myself. Mm -hmm. If I just made the goal of lacing up my shoes and walking to the end of my driveway and I did it, I am giving myself a sense of accomplishment. And that is one of the things that's going to start to change the way that I think. And so I love what you're saying about, you know, put on the, the video and just watch it. Give yourself permission. And if you happen to move, great. And, you know, at least you watched it. I think these are really good tips. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I also love, sorry, I also love dancing. I got to say, like, that's been my thing. Like, uh, put on one song that I just can't not tap my toes and groove to. And that's something that has really helped me to get back into exercise. Well, and I think that is a really important thing to say, because I think when people think about working out and exercise, we have this idealistic notion that it means CrossFit or running Mm -hmm. or, um, you know, something that's so hardcore because that's pretty much what society presents exercise at. And it can be just like throw on some groovy tunes. And did I just date myself with the word groovy? Yeah, maybe. (laughs) Throw on some tunes and like that is joyful movement. So maybe it it takes for somebody to reframe what exercise actually means. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I've had so many people say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not a gym goer. Well, it doesn't have to be that that form of exercise. It can be anything. And there's so much available um, for free online or through, you know, purchasing programs or community centers whatever, there's so much fitness available in so many different forms like Tai Chi or whatever you Mm -hmm. can possibly think of, it's out there. And it doesn't even have to be like a, you know, a specific type of exercise, like you say, just dancing or putting on the tunes and cleaning your house. Like when I clean my, give my house a Mm -hmm. good, I I get a sweat on, like, you know, uh, I'm not sure how joyful that is, but. (laughs) (laughs) Hey. When my tub is clean, I got to say, there, it, it is pretty joyful. Yeah, um, because that, then you can go have a nice warm bath afterwards. Exactly. That's, that's more self-care. Yeah. And, you know, here's, I love that you said something about joyful movement. And that's the thing. Like, when we move our bodies, not only does it increase endorphins, but there's a feeling of aliveness that happens. Because I am now taking also in more breath. I am moving my body, and I am taking in breath. And, you know, when I felt depressed, I, I felt less than alive. I, I felt muted, if, if that's an okay way of, of saying it. Like, I felt muted and detached. And so when I was actually, like, putting on a groovy tune, but yes, we're dating ourselves, um, <laughs> and I could probably get down to it pretty good, pretty hardcore, uh, you know, that, I felt alive again. And, and that really helped to also change um, my thinking and how I felt. Yeah. I think it's really in the way that we, we frame it and, and by giving ourselves permission, I feel, you know, another theme that I see with a lot of the women that I work with is this um, harshness and perfectionism that if it's not going to look and be a certain way, then they're, they're an ultimate failure. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I, I feel so, um, I don't know what the word is when I, when I see that, I feel so, I, I feel sad because I just feel like it, it's, it's a defeating way of thinking and that we put so much pressure on ourselves as women to look a certain way and be a certain way and, and act a certain way that I think that if we can start just giving ourselves permission and, you know, just approaching our own behaviors with a little bit more um, self-care and love, yes. we can really reframe <clears throat> what joyful movement means and fitness and self-care and what that all looks like. Yeah. Are you okay if I get a little bit deep here? Go deep, sister. Go deep. All right. <laughs> so, I, you know, for me, I know that besides sort of just what was happening in my life around depression, my depression was really related to some core beliefs that I had established at a very young age. So I had some childhood trauma that, you know, and we don't even need trauma as children to develop a sense of some form of I'm not good enough. Um, I can't, I don't want to go into the science here right now, but our brains basically adapt if our parents aren't there for us in a way that we want them to be. And we often grow up with some feeling of I'm not good enough. And the thing is, is that wound is so uh, painful that what happens is we create a mask or a strategic self. Um, we overcompensate for feeling not good enough. And that's where the perfectionism comes in. But we feel like I can't just show up as me every day. I've got to be all the things. I've got to be super mom and super worker and have a super clean house and have uh, my body has to look a certain way. And I've got to have my eyebrows microbladed. You know, I've got to do all of this stuff just so that I can 
feel like I'm on the same level as everybody else. But that means that I'm now jumping onto this, this hamster wheel, this rat race, where I constantly feel like no matter what I do is never going to be enough. And if like that for me was, was a part of that crippling depression uh, in holding on to some belief about being le- worth less than um, and what I felt like I had to do just to measure up. But don't you feel like society perpetuates that towards people every day? Like you can have those feelings because of um, trauma or situations that happened in your childhood. Yeah. But then our society reaffirms that woman every single day in our face. So not only Absolutely. are you feeling it because you have this hole within from a deeper, yeah. deeper situation, but then we're, we're pounded with it every day. Like you should be this, you should look this way on top of all this. You should be, you know, running for the president of the United States and a sex goddess. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll take one out of two of those. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I do think that society perpetuates it. And, you know, growing up as a plus size girl and being a plus size woman, I think there are so many things that I feel like I had to um, push through just to be enough. Uh, and that was also hard. I mean, I think a lot of depression actually comes from suppression. And what I mean by that is I am told that if I'm going to be plus size and wear something, uh, I have got to, you know, fit into a very certain mold, mm-hmm. um, not one of being an athlete uh, or athletic, one of being the funny uh, sidekick, um, you know, uh, and so I, it's, it's really hard for, I think, a lot of plus size people, for, I'll speak for myself, to actually find their place in the world where they feel like they're enough and that they're okay. Um, and I have, you know, spent a lot of my journey working on really loving me because I think that when I'm depressed, I've stopped seeing my value and I've stopped loving myself. So anything I can do that promotes uh, self-love is something that's going to very much help. So I love that so much. I'm just wondering, I think what many of the listeners are probably thinking at this point is, but how? Right. So is there, <clears throat> is there anything that you can offer that tips that could show women how they can cultivate, um, you know, understanding and appreciating their value and, and, and implement, implementing more self-love into their lives? Ooh, I think there's a, a lot of things. Um, and again, I'll just speak for myself. So first of all, I'd say, if you are feeling depressed, you felt low for more than a few weeks um, or repeatedly, definitely go speak to your family doctor, go talk to a mental health care professional um, because talk therapy is, is going to be something that's very helpful. I have, you know, I'm a therapist and I am always in therapy. I think that's something that, you know, my mind is a very dangerous place and I don't always need to go in there alone. Um, so it's always really helpful to have someone else to give me a reality check. So I think that's one of the important things for me has been really digging in to do my work because when I was feeling depressed, I basically was making my life as small as possible. I didn't want to be triggered by things that reminded me that I wasn't good enough. So I kept making my life smaller and smaller and smaller, but then it gets to a place where it's just so sad and lonely in that smallness. So I actually needed to allow myself to open up to see that whatever was triggering me was actually a doorway. It was sort of my unresolved work that I needed to take a look at. Um, And so I I often, I really recommend doing that work, not on your own. Um, I would also say that for me, um, you know, doing things like uh, changing my Facebook so that I got rid of every single ad that ever said anything about smaller tummies and all of that stuff and just told them it was offensive and not to put it on my feed anymore. And I just started making sure that I was keeping my, my social media feeds full of bodies that looked like mine. And so I know my relationship with me is indicative of how I feel about other people. So, you know, years ago, I'd go to the pool and I'd see a larger person and think, oh my goodness, 
<clears throat> how is she wearing that? Like I was judging her because I was judging me. Yeah. I'm at the place now where I go to the pool and I'm not, you know, mm-hmm. creepy old woman who dresses, who undresses naked. Like when I was a kid, I used to think that was always weird. Right. Why is that old woman dressing, you know, undressing and letting me see her boobies, um, go into a room, but no, I don't. I just, I go out there. I don't put a t-shirt on, you know, because I actually feel totally okay about who I am in my own body. And that came from just really changing what I was allowing to come into my world. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that so much. For you. Oh, there's a bit of feedback here. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I love that how you um, say that when you're judging somebody, it's usually a reflection of you judging yourself because I find that too. Like the things that irritate me the most about people <laughs> are typically things that I'm completely guilty of as well. And so it's kind of that reflection of something I don't like about myself. Then mm-hmm. I'm projecting it onto other people like, oh, God, look at that. Um, yes. and, and it's really, really important to kind of have that awareness because, um, you know, when, when you feel that you're judging other people, it's, it's a great time to kind of look within. And I agree, too. Like, you know, doing that alone isn't always the most objective. <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah. I buy my own BS quite often. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> It's good to have somebody call me on it. <clears throat> yeah, and a professional too, right? Like, I mean, yes. I think often, you know, my husband will pretty much say, he'll, he'll want to say things that he probably knows that I want to hear or, you know, he always has my back. He's not really coming from a pro, uh, an objective position. So to have somebody that's professional, mm-hmm. that's like completely not part of your um, co-signing your BS kind of Yes, talk, yes. Um, I think is really important. And what what is fantastic about therapy and counseling is that the stigma has really been removed over the, um, you know, 10 years, 20 years. Um, I just noticed this morning on the news that they are now bringing into the school systems um, part of health education is all about mental health, which I was quite surprised that they're just doing that now because, you know, as teens suffering with mental health, um, depression and anxiety, you would have thought that that was something that they're teaching, but now it's, you know, part of the curriculum um, because, you know, to suffer in silence is certainly not the way to go about this. Absolutely not. And, you know, it is really, I think uh, there is a stigma when people sometimes will take time off or days off because of mental illness and people think, wow, well, there's nothing actually wrong with you. And you know what there is, if you've ever experienced it, it is debilitating and we often do need to take a pause so that we can actually look at what is going on because I sometimes see like people will hit places in their life like where suddenly they're really depressed and maybe something actually new hasn't happened but they have been trying to outrun years of things that they haven't been dealing with and at some point our body just says look like I can't continue to not look at this so I, we're going to just, you know, take a break right now because you really need to, to look at this so that you can continue to have the kind of life that you want. Yeah, I, I agree. And, um, you know, I think that's what happened with me with diet culture is mm. I was in a constant phase of not good enough. And yes. after my bouts of depression were, you know, I, you know, I would have bouts of depression. It wasn't a constant, but they were probably from years of just rejecting myself. Yes. um, You know, that, that caught up with me. And one day I was just like, I'm done. I can no longer be this person. I can no longer put the energy towards putting up this facade to be somebody that I'm completely not. Yes. And honestly, that was probably one of the most freeing moments of my life. Oh, And, you know, I I love that because I I do think that when we are, you know, it is, we're, I feel like it's been a battlefield for me to like myself. Like that's almost, and I think there's a meme somewhere on social media that it says like, you know, self-love is an act of rebellion. And and I do believe that. I mean, everything that we're told is, is around this culture of not good enough. And that is, you know, um, that is really old right? That is not the place where I want to live my life. If I am constantly feeling like I need to use 
pain in order to push myself, if I need to use negative self-talk in order to almost beat myself into taking a, a step, right? Like if I feel, I have to feel so badly about myself in order to push myself to make a change, that is not a sustainable model. There is nowhere because the minute that I start feeling better about myself, then I wouldn't be motivated if I'm using like negativity as motivation. You know, my favorite, my favorite quote is by Reverend Dr. Michael Beckwith. Um, he was in the secret and other things, but he says, pain pushes until vision pulls. And you know, there are people who hit depression because they haven't found that sense of purpose and that vision for what they want to create for themselves, or they know what it is and they don't believe that they can have it. And so, you know, the more that we can encourage people to feel positive about themselves, to believe that they can attain things, um, is actually the way out of a lot of these things that we find yeah that's really powerful mm -hmm. <clears throat> so i think we should just maybe leave today on some you know re revisiting some of the things that we've talked about so yes. from my perspective as far as fitness goes i want mm -hmm. people to really think about reframing what fitness is yes so whatever brings you joyful newman and a lot of times people will say well i don't know what that is Mm -hmm. um, and so I asked them to kind of revert to what did you enjoy as a child? Was it bike riding? Mm -hmm. Was it um, dance? Like a lot of people like dance. Um, really think about before all these mixed messages came into your life and yeah. these, these taught things that were like, oh, you should be this and you should be that. What was it that you were drawn to and, and really brought you joy? And, and do more of that. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that we talked about as far as the fitness component here is um, just take a couple of steps. If you're feeling depressed, um, don't give yourself permission to not do the whole thing or not do any of it. Just maybe go step outside or maybe yes. do the driveway. Like it doesn't have to be this big, perfect scenario that we believe that it needs to be. It can be any movement forward which means maybe just even standing up from the couch or getting out of bed. Um, May I add something in here, Louise? Yeah. Um, and when you do that half lap around your, you know, uh, driveway or you take out the garbage, come back in and celebrate that. Be yeah. excited and make sure you affirm that you, like you did it. Don't be like, Oh, I only did half the driveway. This has got to be about, yes, I did half the driveway because that is how you're going to start to create new pathways within your brain for more positivity. Yeah. And, I mean, we talked about that as well. That's another tip we can talk about here is that, um, you know, this is much easier said than done, but I really like um, that you're talking about celebration because we are kind of programmed to be like, well, I only did, I see this all the time in my groups. I went for a run, but I was slow. I went for yeah. a walk, but I only did this. I went for this and I only did that. But it's like, why can't we celebrate what was accomplished um, without there being that, <clears throat> you know, post amble of, but this so really try to catch yourself before you go into that place of um you know this happened but this happened mm -hmm. yeah i think that's fantastic absolutely celebrate the small wins absolutely is there any tips that quick tips that we discussed that we want to just leave um for the listener to ponder before we sign off here hmm I, I do, I, I would like to add one thing about how we treat ourselves with love when sometimes we feel so far removed from it, when we've been in that dark place for so long. And what I would say is I look at, you know, my niece and nephew, they're four and two, and I think about, you know, if how I would treat them, right? Um, and if they came to me and they were upset, I would love them through it. You know, if they, you know, they want to go outside, they want to dance around, they want to have fun. So when I'm at a place where I'm really struggling with self-love, I think like, I want to treat myself like I would, like a, like my little girl, right? Like I want to treat her well, even if I can't see the value in myself currently, 
like I need to love myself as if I was that little girl again and that makes it a lot easier and it gives me a lot more permission and I even um, <clears throat> at one point was told to write a letter to that little girl and like mm -hmm. really ask for forgiveness and um, this was part of some therapy that I did and even have a picture that went with that letter. I mean, I don't know if the people on listening to this want to go that deep or, or, or do something different with, you know, the guidance of a, of a counselor, but that's something yeah. that really worked for me because I think within all of us, there's that little person, yes, little tiny person that, you mm -hmm. know, um, want wants to have this happy lifestyle and that um mm -hmm. they're, they're living in there and so i think we need to like you said treat that treat ourselves like we would these beautiful young people um mm -hmm. who really have no idea about all these ideals and and pressures that come on later in adolescence so um really reverting back to that time before it got all crazy well, and you know, um, Louise, that's actually, so my company is Repiphany. And so I want to tell you a little bit about what Repiphany actually means. So um, it, it's about realizing something again as if for the first time. Um, there's a long story about me saying, oh, wow. And, you know, I just had an epiphany. And the person said, well, you've actually had a Repiphany because you said that the same time, the last time I said that thing. And then I realized, hey, like, I think we do that with ourselves. When you think back to that that little that little kid, like they were perfect and whole and complete, and I forget that I adopt society and all of the things that I've been through and my experiences, and I forget that actually inside there is this there's this amazing love and this whole person and there's nothing wrong, and so you know I really want to help people to rediscover that about themselves. It's not about finding yourself; it's about going back and rediscovering who you were before uh, life took over, so to speak. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Mm -hmm. I have found this chat very, very helpful. And I know that the listeners, um, I know that it's going to address a lot of people's comments and concerns about um, what's happening for them. Mm -hmm. I couldn't be more grateful. And I will also include your contact information if anyone re wants to reach out to you. I value your work immensely. And I'm so grateful that you're on the call today. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you for this time. And I thank you for what you are doing to really change the, the scope of, um, of, of fitness and especially for people like me um, who are big fit girls. Awesome. Thanks, Christina. All right.